So I'd like to start with my acknowledgments. Uh, you see here pictured the people in my lab who work on MECFS. And uh, these are the people whose work I'm actually going to be talking about today. I'd uh, like to also mention that Alex Mandarano here uh, is at the meeting and gave a talk in the Young Investigators uh, meeting uh, earlier this week. Uh, this work was supported uh, partially by NIH, but also by a private donor and by Cimarron Research Foundation. Uh, these are our collaborators. We received samples from both uh, Susan Levine's practice and Dan Peterson's practice. Uh, Dr. Peterson is here in the audience as well. Uh, so we have samples that came from New York City as well as from Incline uh, Village. Uh, Gunnar Gottschalk is also here and participated in the Young Investigators meeting. So I'm going to start with a brief review of the immune system because I'm going to be talking about T cells. So T cells are initially, uh, uh, the precursor cells for T cells are formed in the bone marrow. And they differentiate then into two types of uh, cells that I'm going to be talking about, so-called CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells in the thymus. They're maturing there. And they have uh, proteins sticking out from uh, their membrane uh, that gives them the name CD4, the CD4 protein or the CD8 protein. The CD4 T cells, their main job is to secrete cytokines uh, to induce other uh, immune cells to respond to antigens and they do that in the circulation. While the CD8 T cells, their job is to kill uh, pathogen-infected cells, or for example, cancer cells. So T cells become activated when, at the time that they interact with a, a dendritic cell. So the dendritic cell is pictured here. This dendritic cell presents to the T cell an antigen that the um, T cell then discovers is present and, need, and that they, the T cell should respond to the presence of that antigen by cell-to-cell -cell contact. Uh, the signals are exchanged between the two cell types through interactions of proteins on their cell surfaces. Now, it's not important to know exactly what these proteins are, but just to know that there's some proteins sticking out of the, uh, the dendritic cell that interact, bind to, and interact with the T cell. Tell the T cell there's uh, something they need to do, and the T cell then becomes activated and starts doing its job. So we have a way of tricking T cells. We can isolate T cells from the blood, and we can then mix them with antibodies. Uh, that uh, to the T cell, that antibody looks like uh, a protein that's sticking out from a dendritic cell, but it's actually just an antibody that's reacting with the proteins on the T cell. And if you do this, give them some antibodies, and also give them a cytokine called IL-2, in the test tube, you can then activate the T cells in vitro. The reason I'm explaining this is I'm going to show you that we did some studies with T cells that we had activated in vitro. So what happens when you activate a T cell? Well, a, a quiescent T cell that's not doing much, hasn't interacted with that dendritic cell, is, is of course carrying out metabolism. It's carrying out glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, which are ways that the cell generates energy. But after, uh, after activation, the T cell starts proliferating. And in order to do that, it has to upregulate both glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. So in order to see what happens in MECFS uh, cells, T cells from MECFS patients, we can use this device called a seahorse. And it's not really important for you to know exactly how the seahorse works, but what is important to know is that uh, we can measure glycolysis using the seahorse device, the level of glycolysis occurring in a batch of cells, as well as the, the uh, we can also separately measure oxidative phosphorylation. Now in the cell, uh, the cell get, gets a, a lot of ATP, which is the energy currency, uh, from oxidative phosphorylation, but it also gets a modest amount from glycolysis. Both of these uh, processes are important for the cell's function. 
Glycolysis is also important because it helps generate uh, uh, biosynthetic molecules that the cell can use as it's replicating. So both of these processes are important for the cell to be able to replicate and carry out its function. So our study population for this part of my talk is from Incline Village, and it was, uh, as I said, this work was partially funded by Cimarron Research, and the uh, uh, patients and controls came from the practice of Daniel Peterson. Uh, we had uh, 31 female uh, patients, 19 female controls, uh, 22 males with MECFS, and 26 controls. Illness duration averaged almost 13 years. And as I'm sure many of you here in the audience will appreciate, the time from onset to diagnosis of this population was almost seven years. And we have to hope that some of the research you'll be hearing about today will, will reduce this time needed to, for uh, diagnosis of this disease. This, these are the scores from the SF36. Uh, as uh, Beth Unger showed you earlier, this is a common uh, questionnaire. And you can see that the controls have high scores, meaning that they are indeed relatively healthy, while the uh, uh, patients have uh, very low scores, indicating a lot of dysfunction. So we uh, measured uh, the oxidative phosphorylation in these resting and uh, activated T, uh, T cells. So the cells directly from the circulation that we hadn't treated with uh, any drugs. And so we're looking at circulating cells, basically, that were isolated and then um, uh, purified. And then we're also looking at cells that we activated in vitro. So uh, first, uh, looking at circulating cells and activated CD4 cells uh, in the seahorse assay, what we found, in fact, was no significant differences detected between the cells directly from the circulation or after they were activated. Then we uh, looked at the CD8 T cells, the same thing uh, from the patients uh, and controls, looking to see whether there were differences in this important function. And in fact, we found no significant differences. So the next uh, thing that we did was to analyze glycolysis using the seahorse assay, again in CD4 and CD8 cells, before and after we activated them in vitro. Since glycolysis, as I mentioned, is important not only to generate some ATP, but also to generate some molecules that can, can be used for synthesis of other important molecules. So what we found is that the circulating patient CD4 T cells have decreased basal glycolysis. So if you look uh, at this graph here with the basal glycolysis on the y-axis, uh, showing the controls and uh, the MECFS, you can see that the, uh, uh, the glycolysis is lo lower in these circulating uh, T cells, CD4 T cells. So what about the CD8 T cells? Well, it turns out that basal glycolysis is reduced also in the circulating patient uh, CD8 T cells. Again, uh, here you see the controls, basal glycolysis is higher than the MECFS circulating uh, T cells. So this is showing that there is definitely some dysfunction uh, happening in these uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells. So to summarize the seahorse assays of T cell metabolism, uh, we saw no significant difference in CD4 or CD8 T cells, mitochondrial respiration, but we did see a difference in the glycolysis in the circulating cells. Now, I haven't shown you the data, but uh, the uh, other aspect, uh, another assay that you can do with the seahorse device is to deliberately inhibit oxidative phosphorylation. And when you inhibit oxidative phosphorylation in a normal cell, glycolysis will increase in order to compensate for that decrease in oxidative phosphorylation. So we also looked at whether uh, there was normal increase in glycolysis after inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation. And what we found is in both the CD4 and CD8 T cells, compensatory glycolysis was also reduced. So you can imagine then that the cells, these CD4 and CD8 cells circulating in patients' uh, blood are not functioning properly. So uh, 
Another assay that one can do to study mitochondria is to look at mitochondrial membrane potential. Uh, this uh, membrane potential is important for ATP synthes synthesis, but also it's important uh, as part of the quality control system for mitochondria. So mitochondria that don't have proper mi membrane potential can uh, be recycled in the cell, for example. Uh, it's also important for signaling for between the mitochondria and the nucleus. So it's possible to measure uh, mitochondrial membrane potential using a flow cytometer. And uh, the way this works is that cells pass through an, a narrow, uh, uh, pass through uh, one, one at a time and are irradiated by a laser here. So the cells passing through, it's irradiated by a laser. And if you've given this, the cells a, a fluorescent stain, when it's irradiated, it, the stain will fluoresce and it will be detected. So there is a green stain, a fluorescent green stain called mitotracker green that labels mitochondria. And this, uh, the labeling of the mitochondria can give you, a, therefore, the fluorescence can give you a, a measure of the mitochondrial mass in each cell as it passes through uh, the laser beam. It's also possible to uh, label cells with a uh, dye called Mitotracker Red CMX Ross. This measures mitochondrial membrane potential. The brighter th fluorescence, the more membrane potential. So you have here a cell that has a lot of brightly fluorescent mitochondria. Here's some that uh, not so bright. And again, you measure it, and it will be detected by this red fluorescence detector. So you get a measure of both the mitochondrial mass and the mitochondrial membrane potential. So when we did this uh, experiment with cells from MECFS patients and controls, the CD4 cells showed no difference in the mitochondrial mass uh, and membrane potential. So here's the mitochondrial mass measured by mitotracker green, the uh, mitotracker red measure of, uh, of the uh, membrane potential, and it was all the same in the CD4 T cells. However, in the CD8 T cells, while the mitochondrial mass was the same in the controls in the patients, it is reduced in the, uh, in the circulating uh, uh, and activated cells in the uh, CD8 uh, T cells. So this again is showing a dysfunction in the uh, uh, T cells in the uh, patient circulation. So I've just described to you two uh, types of dysfunction of T cells. We have in, in MECFS, we have impaired glycolysis and reduced membrane potential. And as a result of this, of course, that immune system isn't working properly. So the immune system works by cell-to-cell -cell communication. As I mentioned, one job of T cells, uh, in addition to secreting, is, is uh, besides cell to uh, is secreting cytokines. And uh, there's a lot of, these are all the cytokines being secreted by various different types of immune cells. It's really a network of different cells signaling to other cells through cytokines. So they detect a stimulus, they release cytokines, and there's a response. And if, if the um, metabolism of the T cell isn't proper, you can end up with improper responses. In addition, to, however, to the cytokines being secreted by uh, cells to do signaling, there's another type of signaling that, can, that occurs, and that is signaling through release of extracellular vesicles. These extracellular vesicles that are released also can be packed with cytokines, and uh, this, the vesicles themselves can go from one cell to another. Now, there's several types of extracellular vesicles that are known. There's so-called microvesicles that, are, that bud from the surface. There are uh, exosomes, which are a different kind that are formed in a slightly different way within the cell. And then there are these apoptotic bodies. These are actually uh, uh, pieces of dying cells that are released as the cell is uh, being destroyed. So you have some of these bodies as well. Uh, these are the smallest size class. This is next size larger in general, and then uh, you apoptotic bodies tend to be the largest size. The really interesting thing about extracellular vesicles is that they are not just released by immune cells, but they're also released by other types of cells. For example, skeletal muscle, which is certainly relevant to MECFS. 
So they can be released by these muscle cells, go to immune cells or other types of cells to signal uh, uh, conditions. They are released from brain cells and can go from one brain cell to another brain cell. And uh, they can also go through the blood-brain barrier, which is a, uh, a great advantage because one can actually look in the blood and get a little piece of information about what's happening in the brain. They also are released in the gut and uh, it will also be telling us some things that are going on uh, in, in the gut. So we uh, had a different study population for the extracellular vesicle study. Um, it, uh, it came from New York, from Susan Levine's practice. We had 28 female uh, patients, 28 control uh, female, and then seven men controls and patients, and average age about 50. Again, if you look at their SF36 scores, this is a very ill group. We found there was no significant difference in total concentration of these extracellular vesicles between the uh, MECFS patients and the controls. However, one thing we did find that was different was a significant increase in the concentration of this smaller class of vesicles, the so-called exosomes. We performed cytokine analysis in these extracellular vesicles and in whole plasma using uh, this device called the Luminex and uh, assayed you know, 45 different cytokines in uh, a subset of the uh, patients that we analyzed the total ex uh, extracellular vesicles in. We looked at 19 controls and 19 patients. Now, uh, what was interesting and somewhat expected was that the cytokine content of extracellular vesicles is different than the content in the plasma. Uh, I don't have time to explain exactly how this graph works, but you can think of each one of these dots as uh, a mathematical conversion that represents the, the, all of the cytokines that were detected in this particular person's sample. So, uh, it's a graphical representation of a lot of uh, data. Uh, so, uh, so you can see here the extracellular vesicles of each uh, uh, subject uh, have a cytokine composition that's very different than the cytokine composition uh, of the plasma of the same subjects. But within, the, if we compare the cytokines in the EVs between the patients and the controls, there's really no clustering of the uh, patient and uh, control uh, EV composition, and there's no clustering in, in the plasma either. So uh, we couldn't distinguish using this method uh, the patients from the controls. However, another way to look at the cytokine contents is to look at correlations between individual cytokines. You can make a network diagram, and the way this works is if you have a gray line connecting, say, this cytokine to another cytokine, it means those are positively correlated. Uh, so for example, when this one is up, that one is also up. And if you have a red line, it means when this one is up, uh, the uh, other ones are down and vice versa. So you can clearly see just looking at this network that the MECFS cytokines are different than the network of the cytokines is different than in the controls. And this is probably a reflection of that dysfunction that, that I mentioned to you. Uh, the, um, the network uh, in the plasma is also very different. So uh, we see here that this, uh, this cytokine here is ne negatively cor correlated with a lot of other uh, cytokines, and it's not negatively correlated uh, with these. So basically, this is telling us that, yes, not only are the cells disrupted in their metabolism, but also they're disrupted in their uh, extracellular vesicle cytokine contents and uh, plasma cytokines. So one thing we're doing now is to look at what other proteins and RNAs are present in extracellular vesicles in the patients and the controls, because there are not just cytokines in there, there are other kinds of proteins uh, and a particularly interesting kind of molecule to discuss, to, to uh, assay in extracellular vesicles are microRNAs. MicroRNAs have very strong effects on gene expression uh, in cells, and so if this extracellular vesicle gets into another cell, it can really affect the gene expression. So we're characterizing uh, 
the microRNAs as well as the proteins. So what good is knowing this information? Uh, oh, let me also mention, the, um, we're, we're not just doing this now in patients who were just walk in and, and we take their circulating blood, but we're also going to be collecting blood before and after exercise. So we want to see what happens uh, uh, when someone ex exercises, what happens to their uh, cytokines in plasma and extracellular vesicles, the content of the extracellular vesicles before and after exercise. So we might be able to get a glimpse into what's going on in post-exertional malaise. So the reason that this can be uh, very interesting is that extracellular vesicles are now being explored as, uh, for use in, as biomarkers. They're a simpler, uh, it's a, they're a simpler uh, uh, part of the circulation. It's not as complex as if you had to look at a whole cell. This is just an example from a paper that discovered that people with uh, breast cancer had uh, extracellular uh, exosomes that had a higher amount of, of this uh, uh, particular uh, biomarker, uh, this microRNA, in fact, and uh, they're hoping to actually use this uh, as a, a biomarker for breast cancer. We can hope that we might be able to find a similar uh, set. I don't think it will be a single microRNA, but there may be a set of microRNAs that could be diagnostic. And uh, also, people are trying to use extracellular vesicles to deliver therapeutic molecules since they do cross the blood-brain barrier. The idea is to pack microvesicles micro with some uh, drugs or other uh, modulating uh, proteins or, micro or RNAs in order to affect uh, what, uh, uh, to, you know, to use as therapy. So in my last slide, I will uh, ask the question, what have we learned? Uh, I would say that we've learned, we've got uh, not our work, only our work, but some other uh, work that we're hearing about. We've, we're beginning to develop a picture of what MECFS might be, uh, but we, do, we don't have enough pictures, we don't have enough parts to the puzzle yet. Uh, we need to continue getting these uh, pieces of the puzzle, uh, make the picture better. And although we may suspect that we have some idea of what MECFS looks like, when we have the rest of the puzzle pieces, we may discover it's something altogether different. <laughs> Thank you.